Thank you, Charlene, uh, and uh, thank you all for honoring us by coming out and participating in this uh, event tonight, and, and about half of you uh, tomorrow as well. Uh, any of you were here last year? But you might recall that we talked about this, that on the way down here, down I had a huge fight uh, on the way to, to the same event last year. I just want to tell you that we worked it out. This is him driving down, driving down here in the car. I want to assure you that the far more mature this year is, the far more sophisticated. We, we drove different cars together. <laughs> so it hasn't happened. And we're not, but when we met here, Dan said, Do you want to have a fight now or later? <laughs> Each of us are going to speak for about 15 minutes or so, and then uh, we'll have a conversation, and then just then, then first with ourselves, and then with you. I was thinking earlier today that um, when I look at my own life, and I uh, consider where I've succeeded and failed, succeeded and failed, and by the way, I want to put that into quotation marks for a very good reason, which I'll explain. But where I've succeeded or where I've failed, um, the most painful area of what my mind tells me sometimes is failure, is in my parenting. Uh, because um, out there in the world, it's not always, but it's pretty much that I, what I want to accomplish, I could. Um, the ego and the mind always wants more, but on the whole, um, it's gone well. For a parent, though, um, a an adult child especially, when we look at the sufferings sometimes of our children, um, there's just a very opposite of a sense of success, the, the, the sense of um, the failure, and uh, for me, um, guilt as well. I'm not saying it's merited or that it's valid, I'm just saying that it shows up. And I was thinking about three ways that parents can uh, create problems for themselves with their adult kids. And one of them is the guilty parent. Um, yesterday I was speaking in uh, Chase, the, to the Lake Adams Indian band, and on addiction. And in that community, of course, as in native communities across the country, there's a tremendous uh, suffering, tremendous, uh, I mean, I meet family members who have lost four or five people to addiction and suicide. And, um, and when I present my material on addiction, which is, as some of you who've done my work know, is really based on the science and the experience and the insight that the setup for adult addiction is actually childhood suffering in the family of origin. And so there's all these people listening to me and uh, this mother actually comes up to me and says, uh, I want to thank you because you made such a difference in my daughter's life. Unfortunately, I lost it to an overdose last December. And I said, well, I guess I didn't make enough of a difference. And she said, well, yeah, you did, you know. And but here's his mother who is um, grieving the loss of her daughter, actually thanking me for saying something that implicates her in the death of a child, uh, in, in the sense that had her consciousness been different when she was a young mom, that adult child might not have developed an addiction. And a lot of other parents came up to me and said, well, why do we deal with the guilt? And I just said, well, all the guilty parents in this room put your hand up. There were 300 people there, and about 150 people put their hands up. So that's uh, one kind of parent. 
Now the problem with guilty, being a guilty parent is that it assumes that your parenting was a failure, and then when we look at our adult kids, what we see is our own failure. Now how does it feel for one human being to see them to be seen as somebody else's failure? So it's rather devastating for both the parent and for the adult child. Which intellectually you can understand, but on an emotional level, it's just something that keeps coming up. So there's the guilty parent. Then there is another kind of parent that is also not helpful, and that's just the very opposite. So, which I call the victim parent, where we feel uh, perceived, we feel pain or hurt. Because we perceive that our children, our adult children, don't honor enough, don't honor us enough, don't love us enough, don't respect us enough, uh, don't recognize. I mean, every parent remembers the sacrifices they make. You know, I mean, what the kids don't remember is the nights that you spend sleepless with, beside their sick bed. You know, we remember that, but the kid doesn't know should they, because they were asleep. <laughs> they were two years old. You know? <laughs> So you remember that, and, and, and you think, well, something is old to me for all that, and I'm not getting what is old to me. So that's also not very helpful, because now <laughs> you're the victim of the child, and no child wants to see themselves as a victimizer of their parent either. So whether you're the guilty parent, the adult child is going to resist that, and if you're the victim parent, the other child's going to resist that as well. So uh, three weeks ago, I was conducting a therapeutic session with actually a psychedelic modality, which occasionally I work with, it's very deep work, with a man who's got two adult kids, and he's a very successful man, and a very accomplished uh, professionally and financially, and he's been extraordinarily generous to his adult kids, financially speaking. And yet they keep accusing him of um, selfishness because he won't give them more. And uh, he just had a sense of victimization. In fact, I initiated the session with him because I, I wanted to rescue him from being a victim. I want to, not that I want to rescue him, I want him to rescue himself from being a victim. <coughs> and. Um, He's heard me lecture, I mean, he's heard me talk about how uh, children are very much shaped in their emotional attitudes by early experience. So in that sense, I really do believe that what comes back at us when our kids are adults is very often what we gave them. But of course, here's an important distinction. It's not what we gave them deliberately or consciously or both for it. It's also what we did in unconsciously, without meaning to. As a therapist once said to me, children serve their parents unconscious like fish in the sea. So in this case, the parent remembers the sacrifices he made, uh, the, uh, he believed that his kids had been dead in childhood. And, 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 and all, everything that he gave them materially and, and in terms of his love for them, but under, the impact of, but under the impact of the psychedelic, which takes you very deep, uh, I ask them, well, I, I get all that, but are you able to get into the consciousness of your child when they were small? What was going on in their marriage? And what was going on in their marriage uh, was stress and strain and struggle. And my client was often ragefully sarcastic towards his spouse in front of the kids. And I said, well, what do you think the child is experiencing now? And blessedly, he was actually able to not just intellectually get, intellectually get that that's hard on the child, but he could actually feel emotionally what that is like for a child. And he understood that what's coming back at him now is in fact the impact, not of 
what you tried to do, or how much you really loved them, which you did, and, what he, and all that he gave them, but the impact of what he couldn't give them, which is a sense of gratitude for life, and a sense of real security, and a sense of being okay. And um, he did actually stop being a victim parent. And since then, the relationship with the adult children has become a lot better. But that's the second role that I distinguish that parents often take on, is, is that of the victim parent. And then uh, the third uh, way that parents show up, and by the way, I'm, I'm speaking about the parent side now. Then we'll talk about, I think, the other side. I'm going to read you a quote here. This is from, uh, I'm reading right now four books, uh, two biographies each of uh, Napoleon Bonaparte and uh, Bonaparte and also Karl Marx. And I'm reading two biographies each because um, in the Napoleon um, biographies, one of them is just hates Napoleon, one of them biographers, a recent one, just didn't know the guy at all, and he points out everything that was sorted and uh, egotistical about him, which there was plenty. The other guy brought a hero, hero, it makes a hero out of Napoleon. So he tends to make excuses. So I thought, to get a full picture, I mean, you need to look at both perspectives. And, um, which is also kind of a theme for our our, our workshop here is that there are at least two perspectives. And I actually think that in the case of the Napoleon biographies, at least, the truth is not fully um, encompassed by either one. That there used to be some truths, but there's a larger, more complex truth. And the human beings, we have trouble with complexity. So we have trouble with complexity. And for example, to acknowledge that we loved our children and did our best, and we hurt them at the same time without meaning to. That's the kind of complexity that a lot of people are not ready to, to understand or, or to deal with. And at the same time, for the, I think for the, for the child, uh, not, not intellectually, but intellectually this is not difficult, but emotionally they get. But these people just love me, they just love me. And everything that happened to me that didn't come out of love was because of their unconscious that they weren't aware of. That's what I mean by complexity. And that's why I'm reading two biographies of both of these men. Now, Karl Marx's father, uh, Karl, Karl was 17 years old when he headed off to college, having completed his secondary education. He was 17, and his father was doing the following. I want to see in you what I could have become if I'd come into the world under the same favorable auspices as you. In other words, be the person I need you to be so that I can feel validated in my unfulfilled self. <laughs> That's basically the message. Needless to say, Karl Marx then goes off and becomes a rebel and a radical journalist and, gets, and never makes a decent living. Uh, rather than being a successful, he was an incredible genius, but, but, but he uh, never made a, a, a decent living in his life and faced penury till the end of his days and lived most of his life in exile. Just the opposite of what the father would want for him. Now, whether or not, I'm, I haven't even thought about whether psychologically part of what Marx's rebelliousness. Uh, came out of, was out of resistance to this rigid parental expectation. It's an interesting thought, I will need to explore that a bit maybe. But well, what is exemplified here is the parent who needs the child to be something so that they can feel okay. Now there's only one time in life that a human being needs somebody else to be okay so that they should feel okay. And that's the child's relationship to the parent. The child really needs the parent to be okay, to be okay themselves. They really do, but it's the only time. So the parent then, who needs the parent to be okay, I'm sorry, the parent then needs the adult child to be okay, uh, so that they can be okay. They're being a child. 
they're, they're saying, I can't regulate myself, and I can't be okay internally on a zero okay, which is okay. And that's the third dynamic. There's the guilty parent, there's the victim parent, um, and then the child parent who needs you to be a certain way so that they can feel okay about themselves. And what each of these um, have in common is that none of them allows the child, to, uh, the adult child now, to be exactly as the way they are. So our adult children sometimes suffer. And uh, the parental uh, response very often is um, is that to even make the, make the child wrong for the suffering. I mean, you know, you should have done this, you should have done that, you should do this, you should do that, so they don't suffer, so I don't have to feel so bad. Uh, or to try to rescue. Eckhart Tolle, in his new work, talks about this dynamic, and uh, he says, um, the belief that I know what's best for you may be true when they're very young, the children, but the older they get, the less it becomes true. At times, he says, what, what, you, what to use and mistake may be exactly what your children need to experience. And recently, one of my adult kids went through uh, the crisis, as my kids tend to do, and um, and it was really difficult, you know? Uh, but it was much aided, and I tell you, it was much easier this time, just because I really did understand far more clearly, and not as fully as I'd like to perhaps, but far more clearly than ever before, that uh, what needs to happen, or what ha what's happening, there's a purpose for it. That something in life guided my child to be in this situation, because something there had to be learned. So that the suffering itself was a opportunity to learn. And it has turned out that way. And it's been wonderful to see. But it actually took, um, from the point of view of the parents, not getting over involved, and not taking it on, and not being um, internally uh, crushed or, or, or discouraged or demoralized. Uh, we can have our sadness, which is perfectly natural. But sadness and suffering are not the same thing. Uh, sadness becomes suffering only when we resist it. Otherwise, it's just sadness. And so that non-resistance, in fact, maybe even seeing the value in it, um, in other words, being okay with what's happening. Uh, that's a tremendous gift um, to ourselves primarily, but secondarily, I believe, also to the, to the adult child. And so this is where Eckhart is talking about. He says, at times you may also have to allow them to suffer. Suffering may come to them out of the blue, or it may come as a consequence of their own mistakes. But there's always there is something uh, to be learned. And so, just to sum up, when I look very briefly at these uh, different ways of being of the parent, and I imagine I've been all three at various times, I tend to, my own orientation is more towards the uh, guilty one. I don't feel so victimized by my kids, I never have really. Um, and I don't generally, I mean, my son might tell me otherwise, but I don't often show up as the child who, who needs uh, something for, for them to regulate me. But I surely show up as the guilty parent quite a bit. And I've learned something about guilt. Um, is that it's got nothing to do with what's going on. Guilt is not so much a response to something as a kind of a basic orientation. And uh, 
a lot of us grow up with guilt long before we have kids. Now, if you've got guilt in you, if you've got a guilt orientation in you, and then your kids are having a hard time, boy, the guilt goes to town. It's got a wonderful, it's like, legs are like a Christian tree, because it's got all this material to work with. You screwed up the most important thing in your whole life, you know? But actually, when I examine guilt with a lot of people I work with, and I say to them, well, when in life have you not felt guilty? The answer is never. Long before they have kids, they have guilt. And it's the nature of guilt that it's a very opportunistic animal. It'll perch or find a spot or a cave anywhere it can lodge itself. So that if you give it a reason to exist, it's going to just uh, magnify that. I'll tell you about a, another psychedelic session that I had. This time, I was the participant, and I was working with a the therapist. And um, I'm lying on the mat, and this, I'm sitting with this woman who's in her in 50s, then, I guess. It's not that long ago, a few years ago, and I'm fully aware that here I am, <coughs> my name is Gabor, and I'm seven years old, and I'm with this therapist, and this is a therapy session, and I've taken a substance to dig deep into myself, so I'm, I'm, I'm not like I'm hallucinating or having visions. I'm very oriented to space and time and person. But at the same time, I'm lying there weeping tears, and I'm looking at her as if she was my mother. So it was a kind of a interesting experience, because I knew she wasn't, I knew she was a therapist, again, I was very oriented, but at the same time, I was looking at her as my mother. And I was experiencing myself as a six-month-old, except as a six-month-old with words, words that I couldn't have had when I was six-month-old. And so I'm lying there as a six-month-old cowboy, and I'm looking at my mother, quote-unquote, and the words that came out of me was, I'm so sorry I made your life so difficult. So what I'm saying is that that, that guilt that sometimes we impose on our parenting and you think that's why it's there, I'm telling you, it was there long before. And the, the greatest guilt that um, some children feel is because they didn't make their parents happy. They take on the role of making their parents happy. Which is, which is impossible, because they can't. The parents are happy or not happy, but no child is going to make them happy, except maybe for a moment, but not overall. And that's why Thich Nhat Hanh, the Buddhist spiritual teacher, says that the greatest gift that a parent can give their child is their own happiness. And to the adult, to the parents in this room, I would say that's still true. So that the greatest gift you can give your kids is your own happiness. Because, in other words, if you take care of yourself, not to try and take care of them and make their lives better, but, but to make your own life better. Because that, that removes a tremendous burden. Uh, from the adult child, and the more you do that for yourself, the less you are a victim, the less you are a child that need the child, needs your adult child to make things okay for you. And also, strangely enough, the less guilty you're going to be. So, the um, fundamental message, um, I don't want to be judged what you're going to learn tomorrow. But one thing that I hope will emerge for everybody, uh, whether you're the child or whether you're the parent, we're all adults, is that it all begins and ends with ourselves. It's all within. And it's not so much about the other, but about ourselves. So thank you, and now turn it over to Daniel.
someone's here getting an early start on this material. <laughs> Um, well, thank you all for coming. Um, really happy to be here and uh, be doing this again. Um, as my dad said, you know, we didn't have a fight this year. Um, and, but I don't want, uh, I do want to, I, I do want to stress that everything we're going to be communicating over this day and a half, certainly everything I have to say is coming from um, a process that's still in process. So, you know, we've been at this a while and we've been at it in a sort of deliberate, conscious way for a little while, been thinking about it and looking at it. Um, so, you know, and we're up here because we feel like we have something to, to share, but that's not to say that we've like figured out the one way to have a relationship between parents and adult children. And um, everything I have to tell you is definitely a report from the field um, in my own process of, um, of discovering what a relationship with my parents can be in adulthood. And as I grow into the person I'm, you know, I continue to transform into, which is never done as far as I can tell until it puts in the ground. Um, I want to share a story and um, a personal anecdote from a few years ago, um, something that happened between my father and I, um, and the way I experienced it, and I stress the way I experienced it, so, I mean, our memories are terrible and totally unreliable for remembering what happened accurately 30 seconds ago. We always remember and experience events through a filter, usually a self-serving filter, sometimes a self-punishing filter, but we're not objective. And with this case, the story I had to tell you happened five years ago, and I'm remembering it very, very subjectively. And I'm gonna tell it very subjectively. Uh, because what I wanna talk about is my experience in it and how I've grappled with that sense. So nothing I'm saying here should be taken to be a documentary record of who said what, or what actually happened. <laughs> I'm gonna get as close as I can, but. Um, uh, so we were out to dinner, and this has to do actually with this question of honoring, which uh, Gabo mentioned, sometimes parents want their ch children to honor them, and respect them more, and this involves that dynamic, and, and um, this question of what does it mean to honor one's parents? How, do, how can I relate to that in a way that makes sense to me? So uh, the story is it's pretty simple. We were out at dinner uh, at like a gourmet vegan type place on Main Street that my parents had wanted to try. Wanted to try. Sort of like a farm to table sort of place. And I remember being kind of like underwhelmed by the meal. And I was maybe in a grumpy mood due to some other factors. Also my siblings were there. All three of us were in town at that time. Uh, I was living in New York, but I was in town. So it was all five of us, my mother, my father, my two siblings, and me at the table. And, uh, you know, as with any family meal with the Mad Tater, there was a lot of crosstalk, a lot of back and forth across the table, a lot of talking over each other, a lot of sort of spirited conversation on this topic and that topic. There'd be sort of... Uh, and this is just the culture of our family, and every family has a different sort of way that they, uh, they are with each other. Some families are quiet and reserved. Mine happens to be you know, sort of loud and opinionated. Um, and I don't remember the topic, but it was towards the end of the meal, and my father was saying something about something. <laughs> that's really all you need to know. Because <laughs> that's really all it took. Um, I'm assuming it had something to do with personal development or meditation or spiritual health or physical health. 
possibly I sensed that it that you wanted it to pertain to my life in some way. You know, maybe I perceived it as he was digging at me or trying to pressure, give me advice I didn't want or something. I'm just taking a guess based on sort of the, the patterns. Again, this is all in how I experienced it. And I made some kind of cutting remark, like some kind of slicing, witty joke. I don't remember the content. I wish I did. I'm sure it was very funny. <laughs> um, I actually read a quote recently that reminded me a lot of myself. This is uh, Donald Fagan speaking about Walter Becker. Uh, those are the two guys who formed Steely Dan. And Walter just died a few weeks ago at age 67. And um, they're one of my favorite groups. And, and Fagan said about his, his late partner, his late songwriting partner, like a lot of kids from fractured families, he had the knack of creative mimicry reading people's hidden psychology and transforming what he saw into bubbly, incisive art. And that's my orientation, um, probably how I got into the arts. And certainly in my family, one of my roles that I play, that I have historically played, is like the sort of satirist, the John Oliver, the John Stewart, um, the Stephen Colbert, back when he had an edge. Uh, <laughs> Uh, pointing out where the emperor has no clothes, uh, the emperor often being the emperor. <laughs> and sometimes that role has gotten me positive reinforcement. There's often laughter, there's enjoyment, praise for my, my wit and my, my ability to impersonate people. And sometimes it lands me in hot water. And this was one of those cases. So I said this thing, I made this cutting remark, and the mood at the table abruptly shifted. And I couldn't tell where I had crossed the line exactly, but I had somehow crossed the line. And at some point my dad, after sort of collecting and composing himself, said to me in front of everybody, and again, this is not an exact quote, but this is what I heard. He said, you know, Daniel, there's a lot of wisdom in the Ten Commandments. So, let me just try to sum up the, the collection of feelings and experiences that were going on for me at that moment. Because it was a lot, there was a lot going on at once. On the surface level, there was irritation and indignation. Like, what did I do? Why is everybody looking at me? Don't quote the Bible at me. You know, like one a pet peeve I've always had with my dad, and sort of a, he knows this. We talked about this. Uh, the way he'll pull out quotes a lot of the time because he's communicating. So like Eckhart Tolle says, or A.H. Almas says, or in this case, 
the Lord our God in heaven upon us. I don't even believe him. I'm probably not believe him. But it's there on the tablets in the old fucking testament. So I'm literally getting the wrath of God down on me. Right? And I'm here, and I'm like, come on, just tell me you're hurt. Just admit it. Just admit it. I pissed you off. I, I embarrassed you, you know? Don't quote the Bible, ask me. <laughs> Underneath the indignation and the irritation, there's a, a feeling of, well, there's the indignation of being scapegoated. Like, why is everyone on his side? Why are my siblings nodding and saying, yeah, Daniel, you do go too far sometimes? And my, why is my mom averting her eyes? You know, what, when did I become the bad guy? And then underneath that, uh, there's shame. And two kinds of shame. Uh, one which I would call healthy shame. I've heard it referred to as healthy shame. And the other one, maybe not so healthy shame. What do I mean by healthy shame? Healthy shame is just that sense we get when we're off course somehow. Like that inner sense of, I missed the mark here. Maybe I haven't been acting, maybe I wasn't acting or speaking in accordance with my deepest values sense of being corrected, and rightly so. So that was there. I did have this sense that there was probably something I'm missing here. On top of that, though, was this heap, this mountain of what I would call unhealthy shame, which is, oh my god, I did it again. I'm such a jerk. I'm a piece of shit. What kind of person doesn't respect his father? Look at how angry he is. And that's a fear-based shame. That's a shame that, ex that, that feels, expects punishment. That is, you know, it's like a dog that is going to be whipped. And that was taking over me too. And I hated that. And I was angry that I was feeling that way. So there's anger about the shame, and there's shame about the anger, and all of this. And all of this is contributing to a feeling of being paralyzed, like really rooted in my seat. So it left me with a lot to digest, not just a meal, but, uh, but that particular experience. And everyone else moved on from it. It's not like it was a big deal to anyone else, but as we left the restaurant, I was still really in the grips of this, and I've thought about it for years since. And this question of honoring your parents, because I've been trying to get to the truth in what he said, the goal in what he said. Because honestly, I would like to live a life right. I'm the kind of person who honors his parents. I can see that. Walking around with a chip on my shoulder, reacting to authority figures as if they are my parents, or, or not being able, I, and I'd also like to be able to have a great relationship with my folks, you know, and know them now. And every time I react and fly off the handle or and snap at them or whatever, I'm coming from a place in me that is really, is very young, and hurt, and kind of un, unripe, that never quite grew up. So there was a there was a desire in me to get to the get to the essence of this message and the essence of this lesson. But I had to I had to wade through a bunch of difficult things. So so let me just look at what the definition of honor is. What does honor mean? So let me see if I can find a way of understanding honoring that that gives me some access to something. So, honor is a French word from the mid 13th century. It means to do honor to, to show respect to. Okay. So I should show respect to my father. Okay. So it's a kind of behavior. That's this kind of performance. You know, demonstrate honor. Say honorable things. Act in a kind way. Speak in a kind way. Um, to confer honors on. To honor somebody. You know, like to put a, a medal around their neck. I don't really want to do that if I don't feel like it. I mean, I want to do it sometimes when it's deserved, but. Do I really want to have the kind of relationship with my father where every time I see him, I, you know, sort of bow? 
how and lay a garland at his door and, <laughs> and, and sing a, a hymn of praise and ode. That sounds good. Yeah. <laughs> so it does. Uh, to respect or to follow, as in to follow teachings, or the law, to honor the law. Okay, now we're talking about kind of blind obedience, a kind of just, you know, conforming to someone. Uh, in the commercial sense of accepting a bill due, you know, to honor a debt. Or, okay, so honor the debt I owe my father, I have to pay him back. Or the sense of performing a duty of respect toward, which we already looked at. So, all of these definitions, none of them really satisfied me. Because it all felt like some sort of performance. Like, I'm going to honor the flag. I'm going to worship, I'm going to revere. Um, or behaving in a certain way, or feeling a certain way that I don't feel necessarily. Or just focusing on the good stuff, thinking positively, and suppressing any negative feelings. So, I went back and looked at what he actually said. And if I give up on trying to like, fixate on the exact meaning of the words, what was he really trying to communicate to me? And I remember a quote from A Course in Miracles, which is a spiritual text that I've never studied in depth, but I've, you know, I've, I've certainly turned to it at certain times, and it's full of incredible wisdom. And there's a one quote that says, every communication or every act is either an extension of love or it's a cry for love. Literally everything in the world, everything human beings do is either an extension of love or a cry for love. So, okay, let me look at what he said through that lens. How is that an extension of love? Well, very clearly, it's a father who loves his son, who loves me. He can sense the suffering and the unrest underneath my sharp tone and my cutting word. He can sense and he knows from his own experience that your relationship with your parents is gonna color the rest of your life. And he's extending love to me in the form of guidance. Okay, cool, I can accept that. There was other side to it too, which is what I sensed when I said to him, Dad, are your feelings hurt? And that's the cry for love. the part I had a harder time with, because it was hidden. But if I look at it from that point of view and ask, well, what's he really saying? It's pretty simple. I want you to love me. I want you to see me for who I am now. I want you to stop reacting to me as if we were back in 1978. And I was a much younger version of myself making mistakes I didn't mean to make. I want you to see me for who I am. I want you to love me. I want to know you for who you are. So that was in there too. And that helps, that helps me to soften my feeling around the whole thing. Okay, there he is. He's, he's trying to extend love and he's trying to, he's asking me for compassion. He's asking me for love. He's asking me to stop blaming him, to stop punishing him. This is the main thing I actually wanted to, the whole point of this story, is that in order for me to really do that, there's one step that I can't, I, I can't skip over. And he mentioned it in his, in his remarks. Uh, and that is I have to deal with the hurt feelings that are in me, that are underneath all that sarcasm. I actually have to deal with those feelings. Because that's what's fueling. I don't make sarcastic, facetious, disrespectful comments because I don't respect my father. That's not why I do it. 
fact, if I look at myself through the same Course in Miracles filter, what do I see? Well, I'm either extending love or I'm pleading for it in some way. And that sarcasm, that bitterness, the anger in me, and this is something I think a lot of us adult children carry, is a certain amount of anger. We don't know what to do with our anger. It's sitting on top of some hurt feelings that we haven't dealt with. And in my case, I think for a lot of us, it so happens that the anger, if the anger could speak, it would say this, okay, great. You want to know me for who I am? And you want me to see you for who you are? You want me to honor you? I'm the one who needed to be honored. You were the one who was supposed to honor me when I was helpless and defenseless and small. And that was compromised in a whole bunch of ways. In fact, it brought back memories, unpleasant memories, of an incident when I was three, and it was his birthday, and it was time to sing happy birthday to him. The whole family was there, the whole extended family, my grandparents, uncles, and aunts. For whatever reason, I decided I didn't feel, feel like singing happy birthday on that particular day, and I made it known as three old Daniel always did whenever he had a, a note, I made it public. And that didn't step well with my dad, and we had an argument in front of everybody, which culminated in him saying, you're going to sing I birthday to me, or you're going home with no cake. And I refused. I refused to pay him a duty of respect toward. I refused to honor him in the way he wanted to be honored in that moment. And it culminated in him slapping me across the face which is the one and only time he ever did. And I ended up getting taken home, just to get him, my mom took me home to get me out of the situation. And he apologized later that night, profusely came home with a piece of cake for me, and I phoned the entire family to report that I had won. <laughs> <laughs> but that's my template for being told to honor your father and mother. That's what honor your father and mother means to part of me that never got to grow up, because it got stuck in that moment, defending itself, defending myself for dear life. If I give in to you, if I honor you, I'll be destroyed. My autonomy is gone. I don't have a say. I'm not my own person. I'm just an extension of you. And I can't sugarcoat that that hurts. That's painful. And for a little child, it's devastating. Now, here's the final piece. That's not his fault. If it ever was his fault, which we're not going to deal with fault in this workshop because we don't think it's a useful paradigm. But let's say for the sake of argument that on that day in 1978, it was his fault. He was responsible. Let's, let's give me that one for the sake of argument. Well, it's certainly not his fault now, at age 70, sitting in this restaurant with the almost 40-year-old Daniel. Those feelings are my feelings. They're in me. That anger, that hurt, that's in me. And I'm the one who's been carrying it. And I'm the one who, unconsciously, not on purpose, has been reserving the right to pull it out and use it at a moment's notice, whenever I feel in any way threatened. So if I'm interested in a relationship with my parents, where I can legitimately say hello again, let's get, let, you know, I want to know you for who you are. If I'm interested in a life where I can truly honor where I come from and honor these people, and this is irrespective of whether I choose to have them in my life or not. I could legitimately decide, and some people do. You know what? It's just that given who we are now, it's just not, I choose not to have a relationship with you. That's not the situation for us. But if I want to be my own person fully in my life, I have to own what I'm carrying. And when I own what I'm carrying, and when I take the steps to deal with it myself, to process it, then maybe there will come a time when I can communicate to my father directly with honor and with compassion and with love the hurt I've been carrying. Instead of indirectly in the form of jabbing him with a verbal ice pick. 
So I think everything that my father said about the parent, you know, the guilty one, the victim, and the child, you can hear that I've, all of those things are available to the adult child as well. And um, I don't quite know how to sum up what I said, so maybe I'll just, I'll just stop there and go back and sit down and we can talk about it. <laughs> Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. So how can I help you? <laughs> so, Daddy, tell me about the Ten Commandments. <laughs> so that honoring, um, I remember saying that. I don't remember the context that you recall, but I remember saying it. <clears throat> and um, I just want to explain a little bit what I did mean by it. Uh, see if you can make sense of it. So the Bible says, you know, honor you. And I actually come to believe that the Ten Commandments, uh, I'm not a religious person, um, but it contains truth. Every single one speaks the truth, if you understand it from a certain spiritual point of view. Um, which is not necessarily how they usually understood it, but to me that makes a certain sense. So this one about honoring father and mother, well, of course I deal a lot with, um, with the impacts of child abuse. I mean, when I work in the downtown east side, just a few blocks away, every client of mine, uh, every warrior of addictions and HIV and everybody else had been abused as children, abused very often by their parents. But at the very least not protected by their parents. And so then, what does that mean to honor your father and your mother when they treated you that way? So either it's total nonsense, or there's a deeper truth in it that has not to do with the circumstances of one's life, but, but has to do with a, a, a more mm, profound uh, reality. Mm -hmm. And so when I said that, um, here's what I like to think I meant by it, and I, I believe I did mean, it's not that the child should go through the behaviors of giving honor and genuflecting or praising or, or respect. <coughs> In fact, as you said, honoring them has nothing to do with whether you even want to see them or not. But I'll tell you a story from my own life, and, and, and one of the things that I feel shame about, at least I have, not so much when I tell it now, but when I was a uh, late teenager, I think it was a early university, I was maybe 19 years old. We'd just been in Canada six years. It was a very short period of time. A long time to an adolescent, but not such a long time in uh, calendar years. And my father was a house painter, and he had a really difficult time making a living. Really difficult time. Uh, he was a really conscientious, Worker, but he was not a businessman. So running a house painting company was never a secure uh, employment uh, occupation for him, and he had a lot of anxieties about that. And um, we're, in, we're living in Solano, and there used to be a paint store on Broadway there. And I was walking by the paint store as a student, you know, and I was very cavalier in my attitude towards life, you know. I did whatever I wanted to, and uh, student loans, and summer jobs, and I had no concerns. And, uh, no, you, if you know the character Eeyore from uh, Winnie the Pooh, Eeyore is this uh, melancholy donkey. Uh, everything is always going from bad to worse, and the expectation is that it'll never be any better, you know, so that's, I identify with you quite a bit, actually. Um, but, uh, anyway, I'm walking on Broadway there, and I may even have been stoned a little bit, I don't know. <laughs> I see 
see my dad in the paint store, so I went in and talked to him, and he, his demeanor was kind of down, and you know, he, he gives me his anxiety. And then, then I, my parents still used a few blocks away, as I did. They didn't, I wasn't living at home anymore, but they were just living a few blocks apart. And I walked in, and uh, my mother and, and her sister, my aunt, were there. And uh, I made some kind of comment that uh, I just was on Broadway and I saw Igor. And they laughed. And they knew exactly what I meant. And I just wish my mother had slap me, instead of laughing at that joke. I just wish she would have said, that man is working really hard to support his family. And whether or not you think he's successful or whether or not um, he is um, anxious, um, he is doing his very best to make a life. Can I ask you a question? And, and you have no right to um, to dishonor him like this. You, do you want to jump in and ask a question? Yeah. yeah. Go ahead. Why do you suppose she didn't slap you? Oh, she was an accomplice. I experienced her as an accomplice. And because and, 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 she had some of the stainful attitude to her like that. Okay. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's one explanation. That's what I thought. What, what were you thinking? Well, so that's one explanation, right? Yeah. You, you saw her as an accomplice, but you'd only see her as an accomplice if you felt a crime was being committed. If, yeah. Yeah. So the other op the other option is she just heard it as an innocuous, maybe even a loving joke. Because she didn't she didn't proceed to the depths of your soul and see the hostility that you're probably feeling guilty about. It could be, but it's not so much my mother's uh, behavior I'm concerned with, but with the attitude that I have. Right. Okay. And I just realized that I would have been a richer, uh, deeper person had I been able to see the the greatness of my father. Yeah. And so, when I say greatness, I don't mean accomplishments. I mean the humanity, I mean the, the commitment. You know? And um, so what I was trying to say to you is, you would be more content with yourself You'd be more um, empowered in your life if you saw the parents as a source of life rather than as people that hurt you, and 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 and, and, and which they did, but but if you saw what's underneath that, and so when I, when I think of that commandment. And that's what I think about. It's not that you forget what people did, or even I do necessarily forgive. I mean, forgiveness is not something I ever tell anybody to do. But if you saw that underneath that, there was still life recreating itself and, and, and uh, trying to go on. Sure. So I thought you'd be richer if you could get that. That's what I meant. I, I get that. I completely get that. Yeah. And I think I came to understand that. If I didn't understand, I think I sensed it in the moment. That's, that's what right. you meant. Because you, you explained yourself. That's the goal that you were looking for. Well, yeah. But, so there's, I have two things to say about that. Sure. Um, number one is I think you actually have it reversed. I wonder if you have it reversed. And this is a conversation, not a debate. Right? Yeah. I, don't, I don't know anything. But I just wonder, I think you're absolutely correct that if I could honor my father and mother, if a person can honor their father and mother, they're much more likely to be content in themselves. Mm -hmm. But the direction of causality, I'm not sure if it flows in that direction, which is to say, if I was content in myself, which is really the only thing I can do something about, I can't, I can't work on trying to because what it said, what, what the logic of what you said in that moment sounded like, Daniel, you should really get to work on your relationship with your parents so that you can have a better life. I.e., all roads go through this, through us. As opposed to, hey, wow, if I was happier in myself, I would have no need to knock my dad, my dad down to size. Or I could do so with love. 
if I was happier in myself, if I was more comfortable in myself, he wouldn't, I wouldn't feel irritated the way I feel irritated. If I felt safe and strong in myself, I wouldn't need to rise up like Mighty Mouse. <laughs> and be an Avenger around my parents. Which is to say that if, I'm, if I am acting out, if I am um, you know, acting out, right, which is a term you talk about in terms of parenting, of what does acting out mean? Like what's the child, what's the unrest that the child is acting out? Well, here I am as an adult. What am I acting out? Oh, I'm acting out that I've never quite figured out how to stay how to keep my boundaries and how to feel good about myself and secure myself either in physical proximity to my parents or even in psychological relationship with my parents. I haven't quite grown out of that stage. So that's what I can go to work on. And then the natural outcome of that, the natural, now maybe it works in both directions. So at the, but the natural outcome of that is that when I, I don't have to work at being nicer to you, I don't have to work at honoring you. So you it just is a natural expression of who I am because I like who I am. So of course I like the people who made me. So you, you heard it then, and sounds like you're still hearing it now. It's an expectation to go to work in relation with your parents. Is that what you're hearing? Yeah. Okay. I get that. Or a correlation turning into a. A, 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 a yeah. Exactly. Okay. Do this so that that. Okay. Well, I, I get. Right. And so here's the second one. No, no, because I, because I had two things to say. Okay. This is important. What I didn't hear you say, and I guess what, and this is, I want to ask you, this is a question for you. It's not something I want to say, it's a question. Because what was missing in what you said, yeah. uh, as I remember it, you, you denied that your feelings were hurt. Yeah. You denied that you were speaking from a place of injury. You went straight into teaching mode. Yeah. Fathering mode. Yeah. Uh, Sermonizing, I mean, literally quoting the Bible. <laughs> it's Bible study at table six. But no, 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 I'm not hurt. I'm not, I'm not upset, Daniel. You just might want to look at how you're living. <laughs> now, what? There's all the surface reasons that that's frustrating for my ego, or whatever. But to the part of me that wants to be genuinely related to you, that wants to actually know you and wants to honor you as a full and complete human being, that is a person who's bruisable, who feels hurt, who has an ego to wound, and is sensitive to slights against it. It's hella frustrating <laughs> to be told, no, 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 don't, don't pay no attention to the man behind the curtain. We're dealing with, you know, and so. Is there a question? Yeah, the question is. <laughs> Yeah, there is a question. As a parent, as a parent, what's the role of vulnerability? And a parent of an adult kid, probably young kids too, the ability to, to be vulnerable with your kids, is it possible to be vulnerable and show your wounds or show your, your, your hurts without engaging in being a victim or guilting your child for making you feel that way? Is, it, is there a possibility and is there value in that? Okay, thank you. Um, so what I'm getting about that exchange now is that I genuinely wish for you at that moment that you'll get to that place of honor that I just defined a moment ago. Absolutely. Okay. I may have wished that for you, but that nevertheless was not an appropriate communication at that time. Because, uh, I was trying to fix something. Can you? Maybe I thought I was trying to fix it for your sake, but nevertheless, I was still trying to fix something in you. Right. So that would have, have been a much more authentic response would have been 
um, something like when you said that, I not that you heard me, but I experienced something. And, uh, or even ouch, or even ouch, I don't like that. Sorry? Or even just ouch, I didn't like that. Yeah, but yeah, but, yeah, but would it be possible for a guy to finish a sentence? <laughs> <laughs> sure. I, I thought you were between sentences. Uh, and there was something else that's deeper, that which is coming out of what you tell me that, which is that. So yeah, vulnerable is just you know, owning what's happening for me. Actually, not coming from up here, but just checking in here. Yeah. So yeah, that's totally appropriate. Not to make that your responsibility, but just at least to own it in myself. And then I might have said something like, um, I just wonder, I might have asked you, what was your experience when you made that comment? Or I might have asked you what you meant by it, or, or you know, you are not trying to hurt me, you know. Yeah. What is it that's coming out of you when you said that? Yeah, yeah. yeah but, but instead I became prescriptive. Well, yeah, I mean, and to do that, you would have had to be completely non-reactive and take a look at the situation and say, okay, yeah. is now the time I want to inquire with Daniel as to what was going on under the surface? Or, or, we'll talk about later. or do we want to talk about this later? Uh, which, in, which in our family is all too seldom an option. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, let's table this for later is, yeah. is never, it is just like the last thing we think of. Yeah. And sometimes that's a good thing to do. But yeah. Yeah. But, yeah. And well, my friend Gordon Neufeld, who, um, as many of you know, is a great parenting educator and um, um, fears uh, of child development and parenting. And he says that when, and as enough said, always work the relationship and not the incident. Working a relationship with a man, not working on the incident at that moment. But just, just as you say. Yeah. But just getting whatever happened for me and then and then later on when the relationship is restored and we're you know we're, we're private so then you're not for the whole family with the family stuff. Right. Then yeah, then I could have said well, what was going on there. Sure. You know? Yeah. So absolutely. Yeah. And 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 part of and this is sort of a more subtle part of the dynamic dynamic. But if we assume that, and I think this is worth assuming actually, in almost every case, that underneath it all, everybody just wants to connect. Wants to. Wants to connect. Yeah. That's, that's all we want. I mean, that's what that Course in Miracles quote means, right? That's right. Everything's a cry for love, or it's a con it's an extension of it. Yeah. So if we, here we are, two grown men, crying for love at each other over a dinner table, mm -hmm. you know, kinds of bizarre and, you know. Um, opaque ways. What that dynamic brought up for me, part of the pain of that dynamic for me was a familiar, uh, a dynamic that goes very back, right back to the very beginnings of our relationship, which is never getting to see, not never, but not getting to see enough of your soft side, you know. You not having the, or just not not getting access to, like being met by your mind, and yeah. on top of a whole lot of emotional tension and hurt. Yeah. So basically, getting walloped with calm, measured tones and colorful, <laughs> you know, like like a, like, a, like like a bunch of bricks in a, in a pillow bag. <laughs> so, that, right, it's, it's just, I, and again, this is not to blame or anything. Uh, I mean, by the way, I, I don't. I, <laughs> this is beautiful, see? He gets to humiliate his father in public and get paid for it. Listen. You're welcome to try to humiliate me. Uh, the, no, but the. Uh, I, I, did, I did want to say that yeah. he, when you spoke, you know, he spoke about one of his kids having a crisis. It was me. <laughs> Recently, I've been through a hell of a time with something in my personal life, and I've really been um, the beneficiary of some incredible parental support and love from both my parents. And. 
he finally a round of applause for that? <laughs> uh, uh, yeah. And all you had to do was stop trying to fix me. Uh, because actually what it gave me was the space to just go through what I needed to go through. And it gave me this bed of trust in me and in life to fall on. This sort of, every, this, which is everything I've ever hungered for in my parents. It's a solid foundation. Just a solid, mature, wise, you know, not sugarcoating, not denying anything, seeing all the shittiness, seeing all the difficulty, knowing from experience how difficult life can be. But just a ground of, we believe in you and we believe in life and you're a part of life, so you're gonna be okay. And not only that, and, and, I, and I get that through, you know, nothing you're going through, nothing you can say can, can, can throw us, can, can throw our equilibrium off. And so that's hard earned. And you really, you really, uh, I think that's a real achievement. Yeah, no, that's good. Uh, and, and it was a real gift. Um, so I just want to. So I'm not speaking from a place of complaint. I hope you understand tonight. This is all. Yeah. So it'll be fun. Well, I honestly am not um, experiencing anything you said tonight as a complaint. I did. Uh, I'm just asking you now. Did you feel so heated on this conversation? So I'm sure you Did I sense that with you? Ah, uh, not particular. It's that's just my my that's just my personality. So I, I'm just there's an intensity. I mean. This, this thing around me talking too much, and we had this last time, and you know, when you t told me I was interrupting you, and I didn't think I was. I mean, that, there's a little bit of okay. heat, but I'm not going to call that heat. That's just the sparks between us. I think that's just part of a, a dynamic that is fun. All right, let me just ask them, um, before we turn it over to you, I think we should very soon. Yeah. Um, is there anything else in our, in, in my comments, or anything that you want to raise before we, uh, we just take a look over the audience? No, I thought it was. I never heard you talk about the three types of um, the three sort of pitfalls for parents, and I think that's really you should you should you should patent that because we can put that in our book or something. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that's good, and and I think it's prob it's probable that each person has a default setting uh, that they that they tend towards more, and then maybe under points of stress. Because I have seen you play the like in the victim. Yeah, yeah. But 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 you're but you're more likely to cover up playing the victim. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like there's there's a there's a you have a you have a, you have a zone that you're more comfortable in. And for myself too, my my zone, I'd have to think about the three types of an adult kid. Anger would be one of them, the spiteful one, and that's definitely my style. Angry. Last you know last year when we, I gave this talk, I quoted a whole Metallica song that I was obsessed with as a, as a kid. You know? <laughs> Dear mother, dear father, what is this hell you have put me through? <laughs> <laughs> that was my jam. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> this is the second year in a row that you, that you talk about Metallica. <laughs> I'm referencing last year's talk. I know, but you also, uh, Fagan, who's, what group was that? That's Steely Dan. Yeah. That's a very different <laughs> <laughs> There are some differences. Uh, <laughs> Stop listening when the Beatles book up. Yeah. <laughs> Yes, yeah, no, I'm just, but I, I just want to just complete the thought that uh, probably there are three types of, um, of, of adult children too, so I, I'd love to hear from anyone, like, if there are kids out there in the audience and do you have a style with your parents, mine is anger and, and kind of... There, 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 may, there may even be 25 types of parents, I don't know, those are just what occurred to me. You know? Yeah, but we want, but, but for a chap, like, we want, we want to brand this death. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Please stop me. You gotta think, you know, bite size. Yeah. It, it kind of reminds me of a, I should like to have this joke, but should I not? Would it be pertinent? It probably doesn't involve a In my mind, it's very pertinent, but nobody here is going to get it, so I'm not going to say it. That's a huge sign of growth. I'm going to give you an applause. You're listening to a fantastic joke. 